when I read the script, I thought it was just impossible. The production was so large. What they expected the puppets to do was just so intimidating as far as the range of action. The numbers of puppets in the scene. My initial response to the script was a sheer delight. It was laugh out loud funny. I Very rarely do I read a script and laugh out loud. And then it was sheer terror. How are we going to do this? This is impossible, the most daunting thing I've ever read. It's an action movie, non-stop. Full-on gun battles. Fist fights. Matt David! You think of it. Bam you think breaking. It's pure insanity. I knew right away it was going to be hysterically funny, but I'm the one that looked at things realistically. Based on experience, I know what it was going to take to do it. And I'm calculating this, and I'm going, how many people do we need? How many strings do we need? I immediately look at the problems that needed to be solved. And I went, holy cow, guys, do we want to get involved with this? And then we, when we read the material, we said, you know, we can't say no. I don't know about you, Trey, but I think these look great. I think this is going to make a great movie. I think you did a great job making these heads, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Let's look at the ones you made, and then we'll look at the ones I made. The first stage is design. It all starts with what the characters are going to look like. There's just one problem. I don't look Middle Eastern. The challenge with Team America is building a giant puppet film from scratch. Trey Parker and Matt Stone called me in for a meeting and wanted to start developing some characters. It looks like it gets blonde pretty quick. You know what I mean? Oh, you want just more tipping on it? Yeah. All right, good. This movie will be sweet now. <laughs> In the early discussions, it was to basically establish a size first, which is 22 inches tall. It's large scale miniatures. Our puppets are one third scale, meaning uh, our two foot puppet represents a six foot human being. For Team America, what Trey wanted was basically a young 30s group, late 20s, early 30s, of model type Americans to portray Team America. And we start out with, you know, just physical designs of what they look like. Shortly thereafter, went to uh, prototypes, maquettes were called, little prototype sculptures. Myself and a bunch of other sculptors started sculpting maybe possibly up to five heads per character. And the first character we worked on was Spotswood. The name is Spotswood. Once a style was set with Spotswood, I tried to contour all the sculptures into a style that was not over-stylized, that's really fresh and the really strong, good characters. Pretty much what my responsibilities are uh, to take the, uh, the movie stars and turn them into marionettes and uh, bring a lot of character to them when I can, but also keep them in that style. Of, uh, of marionettes, which is a lot of fun. None of the celebrities have been here to uh, see their likenesses or help us figure out what they look like. That is the fag way. Nor has anybody asked their permission. That's kind of the South Park mode. You know, if they want somebody in a movie, they just do it. I farted once on the set of Blue Lagoon. We're starting our sculptures as realistically as possible. Uh, once we get the likeness of the actor, from there, we then dial back to give them that kind of creepy marionette feel. Helen Hutton took all of a day and a half, so they're going pretty quickly. Once the sculptures are completed and signed off on, we actually put them into a mold process. Basically, we encase the original sculpture in plaster so that we can then split apart, remove the clay, and that we have a negative of the original character. Third stage is uh, casting that mold in foam. The molds are cored to create a really thin layer of skin. So we take various liquid components, whip them up into a, a foam material, inject them into the molds. We are making the armatures uh, and the foam hands and everything for uh, all of the little hands for all of our puppets right now. They're all starting off as little wire and urethane cores, basically, which we will be inserting into the mold, lining up with the fingers, and then injecting foam latex around. That gets cooked in an oven for several hours, depending on the size of the piece, and we'll open it up, we'll have a little guy like this. When it comes out, we get a very thin, flexible, lifelike skin material. Here, as you can see, is obviously a terrace, because he's brown. <laughs> using, using brown paint, we delineate terrace from other people in the, in the script. We start with a blank foam rubber uh, head of one of the characters, and then I begin airbrushing the color on them. 
and then hand painting the eyebrows on. And then when the airbrushing and coloring is all finished, the skin is removed. It's then given to the next link in the chain, which then glues the skin down to the mechanical skulls. I have to actually pull and stretch the faces to get them into the appropriate positions and then glue them onto the mechanical substructures so that when mechanics work that they drive the rubber faces. We had never had a head this small with this much uh, sophistication built into it. The heads, they're empty shells that we then fill with a, a bundle of servos and linkages to make all the, the facial features operate, the eye blinks, the eyes left and right looking and smiles and jaw and everything. So the head is pretty packed with uh, little items there. Well, these are full animatronic heads, and in order to uh, sync the dialogue with the jaw, they're using a software that was developed by a company named Gilderfluke, and uh, we've modified it and applied it to uh, the Kyoto Brothers puppet control system. Basically, uh, the input sticks here will uh, manipulate the jaw, and we record it and play it back with this software. Please, Gary, I'm not from Hollywood. I'm not going to fuck your mouth, and my time is extremely valuable. Yes, that's nice. We have a great bunch of artists working for us from uh, mechanical engineers to seamstresses to hairstylists. I mean, we have people working on wigs that they're hand tying strand by strand wigs, you know, making eyebrows and eyelashes. The level of detail from miniatures to wardrobe has been top notch. Part of what appealed to me was the fact that it was something I'd never done before and so I knew it would be a unique challenge. We started finding very small zippers, very small buttons, and fabrics, uh, just traditional fabric stores, but just looking for the smallest scale and everything. I don't think that the director had any expectations. I think it was wide open. So I think they got a lot more than they were expecting. <laughs> I felt from the beginning, like if this didn't have great attention to detail, that it really wouldn't be worth doing. I felt like these costumes would be as if you were looking at things under a uh, magnifying glass, because even though the scale is very small, once you put it on the big screen, they would be magnified. When we come to a place like this, it just scares us, because it's still just our dumb little stupid gay script that we wrote, and then we come somewhere here, we're like, oh my god, all these people are really working on this. <laughs> like, it's kind of freaky. The cool thing that we do about our, our job, our business, is that we bring characters to life in a truly handmade fashion. It's real, it's tangible. It's not a computer imagery that's going out there. It's a real object with real light falling on it, with great artisans working on it. Everything is handmade, and that's really the great thing about the whole movie. This film stands for everything that is great about America. We're out there trying to protect the world for our values. Whether they want us to or not. Yeah.